But I never go in it. All right. So we're going to get started. We're going to get started here. Um, up next, we have Trevin Hetzel, and he's going to be talking about front end performance. Yeah, so my name is Trevin. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Trevin Hetzel or my blog at Trevin.co. Um, I work for a company here in Omaha called Flywheel. We are a premium WordPress hosting company. And a lot of the experience at Flywheel kind of has led up to putting this talk together um, as, I'll, as I'll talk about. Um, ah, there it goes. So, uh, I'm going to be talking about front-end performance or how to make websites load super fast. Uh, I should clarify though, before I begin, that I'm in no way an expert at front-end performance. Performance is just kind of something that I've been very intrigued by lately, and I've been doing a lot of research on it and experimenting to kind of find the best ways to make sites load super fast. Uh, but there's still a lot to learn. Um, so, however though, I, I have had the opportunity over the past few months at Flywheel to um, kind of put a lot of the things that I've been learning um, about performance into practice on our, on our Flywheel site, in flywheel.com. So it's been kind of the perfect, um, I don't want to say testing ground because Tony will yell at me for testing on the live site, right? But uh, <laughs> it's been, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's been a great um, uh, learning experience and a great way to kind of see things, um, you know, different performance things and how they work and what doesn't work. Uh, so I am proud to say that our homepage is now about three times as fast as it was before I started making optimizations. So uh, most of those things that I learned is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so I'm going to start with a quote here that you may have heard before by a guy named Steve Souders. It's either Souders or Souders. Souders. Or Souders. Souders. Okay, so the quote is 80 to 90 percent of the end user response time is spent on the front end. So start there. So this is a very popular and often referred to quote. Um, it's actually known as the performance golden rule. So it's really popular and um, basically what Souders is saying is that out of the total time that it takes to load a website, most of it is spent loading and interpreting assets on the front end. Uh, so since most of us here tonight are probably front end developers, um, it's, that's great news for us uh, because we have so much influence over a site's performance. So I just threw up a bunch of different techniques here, um, just a bunch of different things you can do to make your site load fast, right? Just pick up a few like caching headers or use a CDN, um, work on your CSS, reduce your cookies, etc. Um, so these are all great techniques, and I recommend that uh, that you you know use all of these techniques. However, we don't have enough time to cover them all, and um, since this is a talk on just front end performance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to only talk about three. All right, I've broken it out into uh, images, CSS, and JavaScript, because after all. These really are the three main resources that make up the front end of a site, except for maybe like your markup or your um, maybe some videos or, or fonts. But for the most part, images, CSS, and JavaScript uh, make up the, the majority of uh, the front end of a site. So that's what we're going to focus on tonight. And before we get before we dive into the, the techniques, um, I want to talk a little about what I consider to be the most valuable metric that you should care about in terms of uh, front-end performance. And it's something called perceived performance. Okay, so perceived performance is a metric used to measure how fast the site feels like it loads. Uh, it's how fast the user thinks your site loads. Right, so the, the amount of time that it takes for your page to be usable does not have to uh, reflect how large that site is. Because your page can be really, really heavy, but still feel really, really light, 
if we do our jobs right as front end devs and, and get that perceived performance down. So uh, Scott Gell says a lot that weight does not need to increase weight. I think that's a, a great quote that um, no matter how big your site is, we can still do things to make it feel snappy and you know, be perceived as fast. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, I know it's kind of a, if you've never heard of perceived performance before, it might be kind of hard to grasp, but I mean, basically, like, all a user really cares about is how quickly that they can interact with the site and see content or um, perform actions without a delay, uh, right? I mean, it might take several seconds for a site to load over, like, 3G, for instance, but if we do our job right, the site will be usable much sooner. So, I'll talk about this coming up. Um, with you know, how we can perceive a site to be uh, loaded when it's really not totally completely loaded. Um, there's a lot of techniques we can do with, with CSS and JavaScript specifically to, uh, to do that. So here's just a little film strip. I was searching for a good example, and I almost wanted to just steal the examples right off the filmmaker's website, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if that would probably wouldn't have been uh, acceptable. But so this is just a film strip, but um, this is of our flywheel site, right? So um, basically what you see here is at approximately 1 to 1.5 seconds, um, things, elements have been painted on the page, right, and it's styled and it's usable. The user can use it right away. Um, but it continues to load and load after that. Um, but the point is of this, of this picture is just that the site is usable quickly, even, even though the site is continuing to load afterwards. And that's called, you know, that's just an example of perceived performance. So, uh, see me after if you want to kind of learn more about perceived performance, because it really is a, a cool, rather new um, thing. But yeah. I think one good example is like having spinners while you're loading things. It, it gives them like, oh, something's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay. So, uh, again, <laughs> before we get into the cool stuff, we need to test ourselves before we wreck ourselves. <laughs> So, um, you know, it's important that we get a baseline uh, and have some benchmarks to test against so that when we make our cool optimizations to make our sites fast, we can, you know, take some numbers to our bosses and be like, hey, this is, this is what I did to our site. This is how much faster it loads. So, um, I threw up these three here. Um, these are kind of my, my, well, two of them are my go-to ones. I threw up the other, what does my site cost, just because it's a super cool new to, uh, tool. But um, basically, I use I, I kind of start out with PageSpeed Insights um, by Google, and it gives you great recommendations on what you need to do. Uh, it gives you a scale on from zero to one hundred as to like how optimized your site is and what things you're doing right. And the reason I, I typically default to uh, PageSpeed Insights first is just because before I worry about the numbers and stuff, it's good to know um, what like actionable items that you can do right away to make your site fast. And so it gives you stuff like, oh hey, you might have 50 images that are super duper heavy. Um, well, I didn't need to run a speed test to know that. PageSpeed Insights just told me that. And then I can go and, and optimize the images or, um, you know, oftentimes it, it talks about how you're loading your JavaScript and CSS and it gives you actionable items um, to, to fix that. So. Uh, I use PageSpeed Insights, and then I go to uh, Web Page Test. So there's there's tons of tools for testing performance. Um, there's Pingdom and YSlow and GT Metrics, and just a handful of them. Uh, I've kind of picked Web Page Test um, just because it's I don't know I've gotten the most familiar with it, and quite honestly, I like it the most because it has a nice little metric called Speed Index. And the speed index score that WebPage Test gives is indicative of how fast your perceived performance is. So the, the faster your site is perceived to load, the lower that speed index score is. And so it's really cool to actually have a metric that we can look at and say, um, you know, that way it's not some figurative thing where it's like, oh, it kind of feels like it's perceived to be fast, right? Uh, with the speed index score, we can actually see uh, and I think it was Paul Irish maybe that said that uh, you should shoot for about 1,000 um, is a good score at, on the, uh, for the speed index. So, uh, and then of course, web page test is also great for testing like your time to first byte, your TTFB, so you can kind of differentiate 
between is it my back end that's kind of slowing down the side or is it the front end? So it gives you a good idea. And then what does my site cost? Again, I just kind of threw this up there because it's it's super interesting, but it's, um, Tim Cadlick, who does a, uh, a lot of speaking and writing on front-end performance, put this together, and I think it scrapes from, or it uses the web page test API, and it basically you put in your site, and it tells you how much money in terms of data charges your site costs all over the world. So um, it's super interesting. Like Our site costs 60 cents in Van 1-2, uh, which is, you know, that's like the price of a pot, you know? So it's, it's um, it, it's a cool tool and interesting to, to see. So, all right, let's get started. Yeah. I was just going to make a comment. I was trying to use those, but my site was on the internet. Oh, so yeah. I ended up using some plugins for browsers. Did okay. Yeah, cool. Okay, sure. I think, yeah, I'm like um, <coughs> HTTP Insights, and I think web page tests might have Chrome um, extensions too. Okay, we're going to start with images. Like I said, we're going to be talking about images, CSS, and JavaScript. So I'm starting here with images because um, they kind of are the most important part of front-end performance. That can kind of be arguable, but for the most part, they usually make up about 60% of an average page's size, you know, downloading and interpreting and displaying images. Um, so they're typically responsible for the largest delay in page load time. So, what's the first thing that we should do with images? If I had a piece of paper, I'd throw it up, rolled up, throw it in the trash bin. We need to throw them away um, because you know, images—they just take up so many requests, and they're so heavy, right? Throw them away. Um, no, really, you see or icon fonts. Um, as much as I would, I would love to be able to not use images on a site. Um, it's inevitable that you know we have to use them. So, uh, however, a lot of icons uh, that you see, like user interface icons and even basic uh, images, maybe some line drawings and stuff, we can recreate those with CSS nowadays, uh, with CSS3. And you know we're already loading CSS anyways. We're already loading the style sheet. So why not save several requests and just um, just write our images in CSS? Uh, and then icon fonts are another great way, especially you know, dealing with icons, of course, but uh, those are a great way to save requests because you're loading in you know, just one request to grab that icon font library um, compared to multiple requests for multiple images. So, and this is kind of a common theme with performance is you want to make as few requests as possible, which I'll talk about coming up, but just you know, whenever you have to make a request, just kind of think to yourself, like, do I really need to do this? Do I really want to give up this, this uh, time spent downloading it? Uh, and then also with images, we can sprite. Um, spriting is, if you're not familiar with spriting, it's uh, basically taking multiple images and combining them all into one image um, so that we're only calling one image instead of, like, for instance, here, that I actually took this. Uh, from our file site where I had like nine images, right? And each one was a separate request, you know, five kilobytes here, four there, six there. Uh, each one was a separate request. Well, it's super easy to just take every single one of these and put them into one, where now we're only making one request. The total request time is, or the size is 14 kilobytes, um, but instead of making nine requests uh, for nine images, we now only make one. And then we can position you CSS to kind of position these however we want. Um, but spriting is a, is a great way to reduce that, uh, the amount of HTTP requests you make. This is a, another example I took from the, from the DevTools. Um, basically before uh, I had like nine SVGs that I was loading individually. Uh, and you notice here the time. Uh, each one is like seven milliseconds, eight, two. Uh, but then when I combine it all into one, granted the size is heavier, but the total time it took was only five milliseconds. Um, which, I mean, I know that's, we're talking milliseconds here, that's not a ton of time. Um, but when you do this continuously for like all your images or all the ones you can, it, it adds up. So that right there, you know, that's, that's an 86% decrease um, in, in the time it takes to load those images now. I guess you were like right by your server. What's that? Did that you were probably right by your server, like location-wise. Oh, I, city. I'm not sure. But I'm, 
I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's been a while since I grabbed that. So, uh, yeah, okay, so after we've done that and after we've kind of found that these are the images we have to use, we have to use these, and we've sprited them where we can, um, what you want to do now is compress the heck out of your images. Images can typically be reduced by about 60% or so, even more sometimes. And um, one thing to note is that Photoshop is not good enough for image compression. Uh, I learned this fairly recently because I always thought, hey, like I have this mock-up, right? I'm going to crop out an image, I'm going to save for 11 devices, save that like the 60 JPEG quality, and we're good. Um, but it turns out that that is not good enough because Photoshop doesn't losslessly compress like tools like these do. So uh, with compression, it's important that we use tools like TinyPNG or OptiPNG or Smushit, um, any of these tools that basically give you advanced lossy compression to really squeeze out all of that extra weight. And so it, it's amazing how much these can save. Uh, it really is. And uh, the cool thing about these is if you're using a task runner, which uh, I recommend that everybody uses a task runner like Grunt or Gulp, um, there's plugins for these, so it makes it super easy to just throw an image in your projects and run it through a task runner and get the compression. Um, also, I did find though that TinyPNG has a Photoshop compression plugin. So uh, if you're stuck in Photoshop and you, you just really don't want to mess with these, uh, you, can, you can save directly from Photoshop and get that lossy compression. When you, so, when you upload an image yeah. that you've already optimized into WordPress, do you lose your optimization because it tries to resize and recompress it? Yeah, so that's a whole other topic. But uh, I, yeah, I've been doing a lot, a lot of um, uh, testing out specifically with WordPress because that's correct. Uh, with WordPress, you usually have multiple sized images, right? Like different featured image sizes. And you're right, if you compress it and upload it to WordPress, WordPress <laughs> is going to crop out each one of those, but they're not going to compress it. Um, however, there are WordPress plugins that, that do that. TinyPNG has a plugin for WordPress. So, yeah. so okay, once, once we've gotten our images nice and compressed down, um, we want to make sure that we're not scaling images in HTML. Okay, we want to only load the size that's necessary for the current viewport or the current uh, area that the image is viewed in. Uh, so, for instance, let's say we have an image. I really should have changed that to source instead of source set. But let's say we have an image that's 1280 by 800 pixels uh, wide and tall, and uh, we're setting the width and height attributes to 321 and 226 in our markup. That's super bad, right? Because <laughs> the browser has to download that huge image, and then the browser is shrinking it down to this little area. Well, that's just wasted space and just wasted time that the browser had to take to go download that. So it's very important that instead, if we want it, if we want it to be 321 by 226, um, that our source is actually 321 by 226, okay? And um, I know that this question would be coming, what about retina? What about responsive design? Uh, well, that's a great question. You know, what if you need at 2x images? Because uh, you do. You should be serving retina images, and you should be accounting for um, multiple um, screen sizes and densities. Um, so for this, there, there, there's a lot of techniques, and I'm not going to go into every single one of them, but I'm going to default to one, and that's the picture element. So uh, picture allows you to define multiple images for multiple viewports and screen densities. So it's a great new element that comes with lots of cool attributes that work really well for this. Um, so here's an example of basically uh, we have a picture element and then two source elements that uh, declare that, hey, at a minimum width of 1,000 pixels, right around there, I, I want to show my extra large image. Right? And then we can set the widths and heights on those so that they're accurate, so that the browser is not um, <coughs> resizing the images itself. We're actually telling it, like, hey, at this viewport, use this size. So it's a great way to, to uh, not resize uh, images in the browser 
Um, and it's a, it's a really cool new uh, tool or element. And another cool thing about this is that you don't have to use the picture elements. You can actually use uh, the attributes that come with it, like source set. Um, you can use those just on a regular image. So also, I, I just threw this in there. Um, this is, uh, it comes up a lot when you talk about front end performance, especially when there's a lot of images. But it's a technique called lazy loading. And basically, it's uh, where you load images asynchronously as they're needed. Uh, so for, for example, uh, let's say we have, we have a, a page here, right? our browser stops right here. Right? So it's, everything above there is seen by the user, but everything below is not seen. So let's say you know, we have a huge grid that just keeps on going and going. Um, it's stuff like it, a, a layout like this is almost perfect for using lazy loading, uh, where maybe when the user scrolls to a certain point, you load in the rest. That way, if you have tons of images on your page, you're not loading them all at once and not, you're not hit with all those requests at once. Um, so this is, um, I don't know, it, it's a technique that's, that's useful in some circumstances. So summarizing images, I know that I kind of blew through that and there's, there's a lot more uh, that we can talk about, but I only have like 35 minutes, I think. So um, basically we want to reduce the amount of images used. Um, right, throw the ones away that you can. And, um, and then we want to sprite, so the ones that are left over, where possible, I know it's, it's a lot of times hard to do this with user-generated content, but in our layouts, if we can sprite as much as possible, do that, so that we save on requests. <coughs> Oops. Uh, and then compress, right? Compressing is huge with images. Get all that weight out of there so you're serving as small as possible file size. And then don't scale in HTML. Um, you know, don't, don't make the browser resize, make sure you're serving the appropriate size image. And lazy load where you can. All right, now on to, uh, on to JavaScript. So I'm going to talk a little bit about compiling JavaScript and referencing JavaScript um, and, and loading it and kind of the things that, that we can do to impact that perceived performance. Uh, so the first thing that I like to do when it comes to JavaScript is say, hey, is this necessary? Right? So many times, like, I've inherited projects, and there's jQuery plugin after jQuery plugin after jQuery plugin. It's like 40k here, 80k here, you know? And more often than not, they're like, they're, they're plugins for things like tooltips, right? Or modals, where you could easily just recreate those with CSS. Um, so, stuff like that, it's just important to say, like, is this necessary that I need to have this in my project? Uh, believe it or not, jQuery is not always necessary. Um, Filament Group has a, a great little uh, library called Shoestring, which is, it basically has the same DOM manipulation that jQuery provides, but it's much, much smaller. So if DOM manipulation is what you're after, which a lot of times, aside from Ajax, that's what people use jQuery for, for the most part, uh, a library like Shoestring might be feasible for you. Um, so just be leery of like, how many plugins and libraries and plugins that, uh, that you start to add to your project. So, all right then, let's say we got all, all the JavaScript in our project is necessary. We've got to use it. Um, okay then, we need to concatenate it and minify it. So, what I was saying earlier with the, um, the service few HTTP, or make as few HTTP requests as possible. Um, with JavaScript, we want to serve as few files as possible, preferably only one. Um, and that's called concatenation, is when you take uh, let's say you have six files that you are serving. Um, concatenation is when you take all six of those and put them into one file. And then minification is when you take that file and compress the heck out of it and get all of the white space out of it and shorten variable names and function names. Um, so concatenation and minification is important with JavaScript. I should, uh, I should mention though, since so many people do use jQuery, uh, I had an interesting discussion uh, I think yesterday actually on the web performance Slack channel, which if you're interested in front end performance, this is a, a great resource. Uh, it's by, I believe, Tim Cadillac and Katie Kavolson, who run the, um, I don't remember their podcast. Path to Performance. Path to Performance, yes. So it's, it's been a great resource for me. 
Um, but anyways, I asked the question, I said, uh, what's the best way to serve jQuery? Should you serve it from a CDN, or should you compile it with your, uh, the rest of your custom code? And I got quite a few opinions, but um, uh, the general consistent consensus was that you should serve it with your own uh, custom files. And the reason that this is a thing where you would serve it from uh, like jQuery or Google CDN is because people have it cached already a lot of times because people are going to tons of sites and uh, if, if one site has this same file from the same CDN and they view it, the browser is going to cache it and it's going to be faster when they come to your site with it already cached. However, um, Scott Gell actually said that they've kind of learned that with uh, jQuery version differences and stuff, it's better if you just put it all into your one file. Um, and then uh, we, they kind of talked about um, instead of one file, a lot of people use two files. They use one file for uh, just the libraries and plugins, things that never change, so that when a user comes to your site, that's just going to be cached. It'll just be there the next time. Um, but then they also serve one for the more custom code that changes frequently. So uh, again, this is just kind of different, different ways to go about it. But for the most part, make sure you're serving as few as possible. Um, and write performant code. Uh, I don't have time to talk about uh, all the different things when it comes to um, writing performant JavaScript. Um, but it's, it's important that you do make sure that the stuff that you're writing is performant, um, especially when it comes to things like AJAX and, and DOM traversing and caching variables and stuff. Um, it's, all, it's all important that we write performant code. So, all right, so the, the fun stuff is uh, the actual loading of JavaScript, I think. And um, it's important to know that JavaScript is a blocking resource, um, which means when JavaScript is being loaded, uh, it blocks the rendering of the page, and so it can't move on until it's downloaded. So for that reason, uh, it's typically, uh, a good practice to defer the loading of your scripts uh, where possible so that you, your scripts load after everything else does and there's not that delay in page load time, right? There's no flash of just white screen because it's waiting on a JavaScript file. So typically this is done and it has been done by simply putting your script at the bottom, right? Right before the closing body tag. Because at that point the browser's already gone through everything and then it, then it loads that in, right? So that's that's deferred, and that works. You can't really go wrong with that. Uh, it's better than putting it in the head. Um, but there's also a cool new attribute called the defer attribute that does exactly the same thing as this, except you can put it in the head. And uh, it's, it's a really cool new attribute that I've started to use quite a bit. And uh, basically, you know, it, it does what it says. It, it loads after everything else is loaded. And it's pretty much the same thing as just putting your scripts down at the bottom of the page. So also, uh, defer has kind of uh, a twin brother called async. And the async attribute uh, lets you load a JavaScript file while other things are being loaded. So it doesn't block the rendering, um, but it doesn't wait till the very end. So uh, it's not always ideal, especially for scripts that depend on other scripts, like maybe jQuery. Um, but it is good for things like uh, Google Analytics or something where it's like, hey, this needs to load in, I don't really care when it loads. Um, so yeah, so these, these two attributes are, uh, are pretty powerful and you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. However, not all browsers support async and defer. That's like how it is with everything in web development. There's something super cool, but it's not supported in all the browsers. Um, so there's these things called script loaders that work great, especially when you want to qualify the conditions of a JavaScript fetch. Um, they, they allow you to do things like, you know, if you want to check if document query selector all um, is supported in the current browser before you load in your DOM library, um, it would be, it, they work great for that. Um, but then they also work great for supporting um, deferred and, and async loading. However, if you're just wanting to defer the loading, that's all you want to do, just want your script to load, um, just loading it at the bottom of the page is totally fine. 
right? But um, I thought it would be important that we talk about script loaders just because they are um, pretty, pretty popular now. Basically, I mean, this is just a simple example where we're just creating a script element in JavaScript and setting the source and then inserting it into our page. Um, and that's just a way to do it you know, deeper. <laughs> However, there is a, a plugin called load.js, or not a plugin, but a, a, a small function. What it essentially is where you just um, inline this in your head, and it, uh, it works great for conditionally loading scripts. Uh, depending on feature or environmental conditions. Um, and yeah, it, it works great for you know, loading deferably, if that's a verb. Uh, so here's just kind of an example where uh, we, we uh, inline the function in the head and then instantiate it by saying, hey, uh, run this through load.js, whatever script, whatever your script loads. Um, I think that currently that's probably the best way to load JavaScript, and that's really, um, I've been using it on most projects now, just this load.js. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, that's loading JavaScript, right? So uh, again, I, there's so much more with JavaScript, but uh, these are kind of the, the most important things, I think, especially with loading. So uh, we'll summarize them again. Uh, number one, just don't don't overuse libraries and frameworks. <coughs> Be mindful of what you're using. Um, concatenate. Make sure you're serving only one or two files. And minify. Uh, get all that white space and, and out of there and the variable names um, shortened. And uh, write performant JavaScript. And defer the loading so that uh, the JavaScript doesn't uh, block the rest of your page. Alright, so this is my favorite topic of all, and uh, it's CSS, okay? And there's some really cool things that we can do with CSS that, um, more so than JavaScript, I think, impact that perceived performance of a page. And we'll get to those, but first I, I wanted to throw this in there, that while this doesn't directly impact performance, uh, using some sort of a standard or a methodology uh, it's very important, I think, uh, especially when you're working on a team. Um, and you know, the standard, popular standards are like object-oriented CSS or SMACs or, or BAM. Um, but like I said, it doesn't directly impact per performance um, simply because G uh, CSS gets gzipped so heavily that um, there's been a lot of research. I actually had Ben Frain on our, our podcast, The Word Break Show, uh, a few months ago, and he's done extensive research as to what methodologies and what selectors and, and you know, how you write your CSS, like how that impacts performance. And he basically found that uh, it's all great on paper, but when it really comes down to it, CSS gets gzipped so heavily that it's not necessarily the first thing that you should do in optimizing the site. Um, however, it's, it's great practice, so I encourage you to uh, use some sort of a standard. Uh, and then same with, same with CSS, like I talked about with JavaScript. We want to combine all our files into one by concatenating them, and we want to compress them, remove that white space, short variable names, uh, by minifying. And using a preprocessor, again, this isn't something that totally directly impacts performance, but it makes your life as a developer a lot easier. Uh, using a preprocessor makes these two processes trivial, um, especially like if you use SAS and you have uh, multiple partials. Um, and let's say you're also using grunt or a task runner like you should. You just run you know, your watch command and, and save away your CSS files and they all get concatenated into one file. And then you just serve that one file and well, I'll show you the best ways to serve that one file in a little bit, but basically yeah, using a, a preprocessor makes this process really easy. So uh, this is just an example I took where uh, the style sheet on our getfile.com site was 112 kilobytes uh, prior to minification. Um, just by minification, I got it down to 89 kilobytes. Which is, that's a 20% improvement. So uh, I didn't do the same with the JavaScript files, but it would be right around there. And so um, it's just a kind of a testimony as to how much you, you can really save by minifying and, and compressing. So 
Okay, so style sheets go in the head. How many people put their style sheets in their head? Everybody, right? That's typically, uh, that's the way we've always done it. We put our style sheets in the head. Um, and the reason is because it's also a blocking resource. So we want to put that in the head so that it doesn't block the loading and prevent, uh, and it doesn't uh, produce uh, fout, uh, you know, flash of unstyled text. Uh, it's kind of a, a weird word. Um, but so yeah, so that's that's typically what, what we're told to do is just put your style sheets in the head, scripts at the bottom, you're good. But Google says if you if you run your site through PageSpeed Insights, which is what the tool I was talking about earlier, and uh, and you have your style sheet in the head, you often see this message. It says eliminate render blocking JavaScript and CSS and above the full content. Okay, so what do we do? What the heck does that mean? Well, first of all, Google is right, and what we need to do is we need to inline our critical CSS. So this is, critical CSS is like the most important thing, I think, um, in, in the best way when it comes to getting your perceived performance down. And what it is, is um, essentially you take the styles that are needed just for that first above the full view, Right, you take those styles, just the styles that, it, that a, the site needs to display properly when a user first pulls it up, and we inline those styles. And that, that way, um, the user doesn't have to wait on a style sheet to be downloaded. It doesn't have, you don't have to send a request and then come back and wait on it. Um, it's just right there in the markup. The browser's just like, oh, hey, here it is, right? We already have the styles. And so it makes things feel very, very snappy. Um, and then after that, the full style sheet is then loaded um, asynchronously so that it doesn't block the rest of the page. Um, this is a, just kind of an example. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory how it would work, but you basically you uh, use a tool, which I'll talk about in a minute, to find what styles are critical for that first page view, and you, um, you uh, minify it and just stick it in a style tag in the head, and then your, your site will load a, a lot faster, believe me. Um, while I'm on here, I, I do want to say that I've heard people say um, that you only need to inline critical CSS on your home page, right? Because, oh, that's like once a user hits your home page, the, the rest, once the style sheet gets loaded, the full style sheet gets loaded, it's going to be cached. So then it doesn't matter going to the next, to the next pages. Um, but that's simply not true because people don't always come to your home page. So it kind of makes life a little bit more difficult to manage all of that inline CSS on every page, but it's important that we, that we do so on every page. So uh, how do we find the critical CSS? Uh, there's several, several tools. Um, Critical by Adidas Money is, is a great one. I, I haven't used it in a while, but I'm pretty sure there's a way that now it actually like will get your critical styles and then put it in your markup for you. Um, I thought I read that. If that if that's true, then that's super awesome because that's like the most painstaking part of all this. Uh, but then there's also a critical CSS by Filament Group um, that works with Corona. So. Okay, let's say we have our critical CSS minified and it's in the head. What do we do now, right? What do we do about the full style sheet? Because without the full style sheet, uh, the rest of the page is just, is just unstyled. It just looks like crap. So, um, so how, do we, how do we load in that full style sheet? Uh, and again, the problem here is that uh, browsers will actually block the rendering of a web page um, until all external style sheets have been downloaded. So unlike JavaScript with CSS, it will wait until all of the external style sheets have been downloaded. Um, because the browser knows that when, a, when it gets a style sheet, it's going to have to repaint things. And so it wants to get all the style sheets, you know, all of it, uh, before it does the rendering. So um, for that reason, that is why we cannot put style sheets at the bottom of the page like we can with JavaScript. With JavaScript, putting it at the bottom, it kind of acts as like a deferred manner. With CSS, that's not true because the browser sees an external style sheet and it's going to want to download it as soon as it can. Um, so, what we do is uh, we have to use JavaScript to do it. And 
uh, I, I don't know if there, I'm sure there are other ways of doing this, but load CSS has, has really been the most common and popular, I think, and, and the best way to get the job done here. And again, it's a, it's a little function by Filament Group um, that works perfectly to load in the CSS asynchronously. Uh, it looks like this, right? Uh, again, you just inline that uh, load CSS script, which is it's not very big, so just you know, concatenate it, minify it, inline it, and then just load in that that style sheet. Um, and then we put it, we put the actual a link tag in a no script tag, just in case the user uh, lives under a rock and doesn't have JavaScript available. Um, so. We might say, though, that uh, inline styles aren't cacheable. What do we do about that? Um, this is really getting down into like nitty gritty, really picking out um, ways that you can just squeeze out the most in your site. Um, but the talk is about making super fast sites. So I thought I'd mention it. Um, and so uh, it, it's, it, it's correct that a, a browser cannot cache inline styles. Right? They can't cache the, the style tag. Uh, so when a, when a browser downloads that full style sheet, that inline style is no longer useful because um, you know it already has the style sheet cached. Uh, so what we can do to solve this is use cookies. And this is a whole bunch of code here that I don't even know if you can read, but this is using PHP. Um, again, this is agnostic of uh, your language, but basically I'm checking to see if a cookie is set. Um, and if that cookie is set, I'm simply going to link directly to that style sheet in the link element. Um, however, if it is not, if the cookie is not set, um, I'm going to inline the, the styles, because or the critical styles, because if the cookie is not set, that means it's a first time view, or at least first time without being cached. Um, and then we're going to do, like the last slide, we're going to uh, run the load CSS function to, um, to load that style sheet asynchronously, and we'll do the no script tag. Um, and then inside that same if block, that's where you set your cookie. Uh, again, I didn't write it out because you can set it in a number of different ways, but that's where you set the cookie. So then the next time that a user reloads your site, um, when they, when the, when the code goes to check for whether or not the cookie is set, um, it's going to be set, and so it's just going to load that style sheet that's already cached. And so this just makes repeat views a heck of a lot faster. So we got through the cool things with CSS. Um, let me kind of recap again. Use the CSS methodology or standard. Again, it's not like, it's not um, always directly impacting performance, but it's it's a good practice. Um, concatenate, only serve one, preferably, style sheet, and minify, and inline the critical CSS, which again, inlining your critical CSS is like uh, the best way to see that, that drop in your perceived performance, the best way to get that speed index down. Uh, and then after that, we want to make sure that we're loading in that full style sheet asynchronously. So uh, that pretty much sums up my, my talk. Um, there, you know, there's other things that I thought about talking about, like, hey, using a CDN or uh, setting expires headers. Um, I, I kind of feel like there's a little ambiguity on whether or not that's front end or back end. Um, but like I said, it, there, there's so much more we can do with performance. Um, I just, I, I hope you learned a few things about images, CSS, and JavaScript tonight. And uh, I'll post these uh, slides later on, on on speaker deck. And yeah, I'll open it up for questions now. Yeah. It's uh, really awesome presentation. Um, Thank you. I have a question about the CSS. So, like, what are really, what is my, what, what is the true benefit of going through all that. Um, the, the critical CSS. What's yeah, the benefit of CSS. using critical CSS? Of doing that, especially now that I have to manage. First, if, especially if I have a large, like if it's an application that has a pretty extensive landing page, mm -hmm. uh, and have to manage all different CSS, 
different CS, inline CSS of the different pages. Um, managing that and then all the other stuff that you just mentioned, like what do I get in return? Really? So first of all, I totally, I, I get what you're saying about it being a pain because I've been doing, I, I, I've been trying to think of the best way to, to manage critical CSS for every page. I actually wrote an article last week or a couple weeks ago about managing this specifically with WordPress themes. Um, but even then, like you still do have to paste in that, that inline CSS every time. And, yeah, if you forget to do it and you're like, why the hell is my button blue when I just <laughs> made it green in my CSS? Yeah, it's maybe you forgot to, to change the CSS. Um, yeah, and, uh, the benefit I, is, is speed. I mean, that's it, inlining styles gets stuff painted to the browser fast so that when a user comes to your site, it's perceived to be very fast, even though the full style sheet isn't already loaded. So, I mean, if, if, if speed is, is a concern, which uh, it's ever in, increasingly becoming a, a concern, I mean, even with Google now starting to um, rank sites based on speed, uh, that's, that's why you, you do that. Is that something you've tested? Was it something you would test? Yeah, for sure. That's what I, critical CSS, I've been using it. Like, a, like the article I wrote about the WordPress theme um, and organizing it, I, I've been using that. So. Yeah. Uh, yes, right here. I have a question about the picture element. Okay. Um, what do you suggest for like browsers that don't support that element? Oh, I, I can't believe I forgot this. What, how, what do you do for the picture element for browsers that aren't supported? Use picture fill. Uh, it's, a, it's a polyfill that provides support for the picture element in all, all of the browsers. So, yeah. Yeah, blue shirt. Uh, for defer, um, does that only work for loading scripts, or can it be used on other attributes too? On other elements? Or elements? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's just on script tags. Yeah. I think you also in the blue shirt here had a question. Yeah, you. Yeah, um, for like managing the inline styles, could you just like you know you're using PHP? Why not just have a PHP included file that just I guess and if it's different for each, never mind. I just realized why because each page is going to have a different. No, yeah, totally. You could do that, but you would have just, like, if you had 20 different pages, you'd have 20 different PHP files. Yeah, because the different things on the Right. Yeah. yeah, right next to it. Also related to inline CSS, uh, maybe you mentioned this and I spaced out or didn't listen to that, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> With inline CSS, does it get replaced later with some CSS that gets loaded in? Or is it, I guess, separated out of your main CSS and not included in it? Well, that's where the, uh, the technique where you set a cookie comes in. Um, because if you don't set a cookie and you don't check to see if that's the full style sheet has already been loaded, um, it, it's not going to go away. It, the inline styles are going to be there every single time. But if you use utilize cookies, you can say, like, hey, if they've already downloaded this file sheet, then don't show them the inline CSS. So the inline CSS would be a subset of your main CSS still? Right, yeah. Okay. That's what these tools like um, um, Grunt Critical CSS and Critical by Adios Money, they basically run your site through, I don't even know how it works, it's like a headless browser, I guess, and they, they, uh, they have certain viewport dimensions and they just extract what styles are absolutely necessary for that certain view. Okay. Yeah, the blue and the red and white here. <laughs> <laughs> so to tie the two talks together, say that I'm using Bootstrap, but I'm only using one or two of the components. Uh, and so I'm loading you know, a 200 kilobyte CSS file, but I only need two of the kilobytes. Are there any tools that can help me remove that unused stuff? Yep. Um, there's a call. There's a there's a couple of tools that will run through your site and remove unused selectors. Uh, Adi Osmani again has the tool to do that, but I can't remember. I think it's un CSS maybe. Yeah, un CSS. Yeah. 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 One problem I've seen with that is if you have styles that you're only using when events happen. Like different button That's styling, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, and you'll have that same problem with critical CSS too. 
like uh, we ran through that. So we, so we had a race condition where we had a collapsible, um, and the styles to expand the collapsible were asynchronously loaded using load CSS later. But if the user clicks on the collapsible before that other style sheet downloads, then it will you'll get into a weird state where it has to, and it won't render correctly until the second CSS. Style sheet. So you just so. manually add on the styles to your critical? Yeah, so there, there is a mechanism where you can say, you can force selectors into grunt critical CSS um, to make it include those, but yeah, it's kind of, it's not the nicest thing, but yeah. You don't always remember to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Another really cool thing going to the on CSS is if you want to do the same thing with your JavaScript, Google has this really cool thing called Google Closure Compiler. And it will go through your JavaScript and, in a smart way, remove unnecessary JavaScript things. So if you're using jQuery, for example, but not all of it, it will not only minify, but it will also go through and see which functions you're not using and pull those out. Yeah. Well, and that's a good point because Google has another really cool plugin called the PageSpeed plugin for Apache and Nginx yep. that will do almost everything that you said for you automatically. <laughs> that's, uh, that's not quite true, but yeah. <laughs> no, you don't have as much control over it, and more often than not, you're, you don't have that level of control on a server, so. Yeah. It's might be related to yeah. the inline CSS, but I'm, I'm, this is something I've seen or heard, so I'm just trying to make sure that it makes sense. Or it's, but, anyways, the uh, Java, like the JavaScript libraries. Does that in any way, um, I'm not sure if you um, touched on that but, or if I missed that or something like that. There is a, the uh, JavaScript libraries, like loading them at the end of the page to make it faster. Is that correct or is that something that's commonplace with JavaScript libraries? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was talking about with basically deferring the loading of JavaScript files uh, to the end so that they don't block the rendering of the page. and. <coughs> There is also, I didn't touch on it, but there is also a thing called critical JS, um, like where you would inline things that are absolutely critical. Like, just like, like load CSS and that load JS function, that's pretty much, I mean, that's like your critical JavaScript because that's needed right off the bat to load up those style sheets and stuff. So um, the same concept kind of applies to JavaScript where if you need something right away, you can inline. Yeah. Um, you looked at all about uh, converting critical images into like a data URI and putting it in your CSS. Mm -hmm. Is that any faster? Yeah, so uh, in today actually I, I had one icon and I was like, well, this is silly. I don't want to, A, I don't want to use my icon font. B, it's too complex for CSS. And C, I don't really want to make a request. So I did. I just used the data URI. Um, I, I don't. I should do a little bit more research to know the trade-offs because data URIs can get really, really big. Um, I don't, I don't know if it takes more time for the browser to read through that than it does an image. I'm guessing not. So I would say yeah, like where you can if you have one-off images or like a logo, for instance, just inline. Same with inline SVG. Um, we're gonna go ahead and, and cut it off there. Um, if you have any more questions for him, feel free to ask uh, after this. Um, but thank you, Trevin, and thank you, Juan. Let me try one more time. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs>